And guys, I want you to know I'm way more excited than that to be here. <laughs> I, that was a great thank you so much. Um, I, listening to those songs just made me realize the Holy Spirit has been moving so much this week in, in your pastoral staff, in, in this church. Um, just listening to um, some things said by Jan in the Sojourners group this morning as she was teaching. And, and then those songs. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of the same words throughout this thread because God wants us to talk about Scripture, and that's what we do here at North Hills. We talk Jesus. You know, there's a lot of things going on in the world. We don't worry about those things because we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things are going to be added to you. We don't need to worry about tomorrow. We've got today. We've got to remember those things, and that's what today is about. We get to talk about Scripture today. So, again, Holy Spirit's been really moving because Ashley, as I sent her the verses to please put up on the screens as, as time goes on, said, John, we cannot put the whole Bible on the screens. But Ashley, it says, for all Scripture is God-breathed. And she said, yeah, John, but we just can't cover it all in one day. So I, I had to take the, um, the reproof or rebuke, as you're going to hear, because that's part of our passage. Um, but before we turn to that, I want to share something that, again, like I said, the Holy Spirit, just amazing this week. I had a, uh, a young man send me a writing that he had done that he just wanted me to read, you know, just something that's from his heart. And as I was reading that introduction that he was writing about his writing to just prepare the readers for what was yet to come. I thought, this has got to go in the sermon. So I texted him back and I said, hey, can I please use this in the sermon? He said, absolutely. Young man's name is Landon Lunsford, NAU student. And, uh, uh, well, he's at NAU, but he's actually studying at uh, Coconino Community College uh, freshman year in college. And this is what this young man starts with in his introduction to this piece of writing. In this piece, it is important to note that everything I write is intentional. Every line and letter has been fully considered. It's all there. Some more hidden than others. It's all there. And between us, we both know it's all there. Pay attention when you read my dialogue. Pay attention to everything you feel that is there. Don't ignore it. Some things are there that you don't even realize. When I read that, I got tears. And I texted Landon, like I said. And he gave me permission to use that. Because if a man who is created by the Almighty God can write something like that about his writings to his readers, how much more does God feel that way about his words that's given to mankind to read, to learn from, and to obey? In Genesis 1, he tells us that he created man in his image, in his likeness. We are a glimpse. Your brothers, your sisters, all the people you can connect with in this world show a glimpse of God because they are part of God's creation. Just like the songs were saying, his creation declares his name, praises his name. We, we, we need to understand that this book called the Bible is his owner's manual to us. It's his recovery guide, his repair guide to us. I think it's ASE is what all the mechanics use, you know, and, but it's... It's a repair guide, but it's more than that too. It's a list of promises that he gives us. And so again, I want to remind you, how much more does God feel that way that Landon feels about his words to his readers as he gives us all these words to mankind? So with that, let's pray and then start. Father God, we ask you to just open our hearts hope in our minds, hope in our ears, because we want to know what do you want us to do with every passage we read. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Okay, on our Core 52 book, I think we're going to put the QR code up there. We still have copies out there if you don't have one of these. If you want to make a donation, that's great. If you can't afford that, don't worry about it. We've got the books out there. We just want you to go through that. We're only about halfway through. Even though we're on Chapter 50 of Core 52, we're jumping around because Zach and the, and the team has a, a method to have things flow in a certain way. So um, I still encourage you to get this this book. It's a, it's a great uh, guide for just going through the Bible and understanding what the Bible means to us through the words of God. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Go on, follow along. I think it's going to come up soon. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want to encourage you to, again, follow the intentionality here. There's an order here, because the order is that God wants us to hear his words. So listen to the teaching. Now, just before 16 and 17, in verse 14 and 15 in 2 Timothy, Paul writes in his letter to Timothy, But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul praised in in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy everything about Timothy's family and upbringing. He was raised since a small boy with the word of God poured into him. We need to be doing that with our kids. As soon as your kids are old enough to understand your words, and even before that, I've got a three and a half month old granddaughter. She's the newest one in the family. And I was over and we got to babysit her. Um, And I'm singing Jesus Loves You. I alter the song so her name's in it. And I, I just, I do that. Because from the beginning, I wanted to pour that into my kids, and now I get a chance to do it with my grandkids. Since infancy, we want to do that. Since little babies, we want to do that. Let them know Jesus' love. Not just mom and dad's love, Jesus' love in their lives. And all Scripture is God-breathed. I've, I've had to deal with some uh, tough, tough news this week from uh, some friends. Because I love the verses that I like, that, you know, kind of fit or benefit me. It, it, for example, us guys love Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. I love that verse. My wife says yes. But John, what about 5.25 to 27? Because again, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. But then, whew, man gets extra verses aimed at him, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Why didn't he just give us only 10 words of instruction? No, we, we are called we need, we need to be doing Bible studies, or we need to be talking about the Bible with our spouses. We need to be sharing things that learn. I praise my wife. I, I, I'm trying to work on that. I praise God all the time. I thank my wife all the time. She is such a support in my life for everything I do here at the church, everything I do with my friends, everything I do with, with going on hospital visits. She's, she just supports that. That's what we get when we do our part. We get wives who maybe it's not submit in the sense of some domestic violence controlling relationship, but you know what? It's submit in the sense that, man, I, we got partners and we're not using our partners. They have a brain that works at levels that, guys, we will never understand. I have four daughters and a wife and I still don't understand the woman's brain. 
because everything goes on at one time. You and I are sitting here and, and you're listening to John preach and I'm watching you listen to me. You know, that's what's going on in our brains. But you wives, you, you women, you daughters, you've got so many things going on in your minds. Help us understand that. Because we think one track, and it's like, oh no, you go down that track, and that's going to happen, and then that's going to happen. You do that, oh my gosh, that's going to happen. Because you have everything connected. It's amazing. And God created this male and female because we're not complete alone. We need to get that. Whether you're married or whether you're not married, you still have to get that feedback from the other gender to tell you. Because those brains are... We work well together, not separately. We can't be divided. Now, also, I still love the fact that I don't need to work for, for my salvation. I mean, Jesus already did it all. So I love Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I love that, because all I have to do is say yes to Jesus. But then... Uh, James comes up in 2.18 and says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You don't earn your way to heaven by deeds. I want to very, very clearly state that. But you know what? If you've got the faith and you've got the change that Jesus Christ has made in your life, you can't shut up. You can't dim the light that is going to glow out of you. That's why I've got a friend of mine here that if I hit past a certain time, he's standing up and he's giving me the you know, big X. And you know, I've, I've got all sorts. Of, you know, I, another one's back here with a hook that if I don't see that, I'm going to get hooked. I've got support people because you can't stop talking about the love of Christ that we have. Jesus also says the same thing. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the word, the world cannot accept him, meaning the Spirit, because the world neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Now, these passages that aren't flashing up on the screen, I want you to understand, are going to be on a list at the end, because when I gave the whole list to Ashley, like I said, she said, John, you can't go through everything at one time. So she'll show you that. That was John 14, 15 through 17. But we don't just stop at the teaching part in this verse, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We have to remember it's teaching, rebuking, because you know what? No matter how much I feel the Holy Spirit in me and how much the Holy Spirit tells me and gives me the strength to do what's right, you know what? I'm going to mess up. We're all going to make, uh, make mistakes. Some of us may just do what's called a trespass where we mess up because we didn't know that there was a, a law not to do that or a reason not to do that. Some of us are going to flat out sin because we know it's there, but you know, we still kind of have that humanity in us, so we're going to sin. But then some of us even say, okay, I know this is a sin. I know I should stop. I know that I got the Holy Spirit in me, but then I'm still going to make this plan and I'm going to go on and do that. Now, I don't know how many of you have done that, but for somebody like me who has known what's right and wrong to do and has chosen to do the wrong thing, when you hit that iniquity level, that hurts. But you know what's awesome is when somebody tells you, stop that. You know better than that. We need to be rebuked is the word that's used in the NIV. Teaching and rebuking. And we have to use the scripture. Because when a friend comes to you with Hebrews 12, 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. It's not even just what we do, 
but even what we are continuing to think when we know that we shouldn't. That's where the rebuking comes in. That's where we get to be changed. Now, some of you may have given permission in your life to others to, to rein you in when you need to be reined in. Some of you may just say, ah, I'm a little bit more private. I get really ashamed if I do that. So I just, I ask the Holy Spirit to do that. Well, then listen to the Holy Spirit because that correction is listed in Galatians 6, 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves so that you also are not tempted. Remind yourself. Be gentle in your rebuking. Parents, you know, uh, and maybe even all of us as we were growing up, because some of us had a harsher upbringing than others, but when you're asking your kids to do chores and you're telling them either pick up the dog poop and you see them not doing it right or they you know, drop half of it and they only do part jobs and everything. Yeah, we've got to rebuke them. We've got to reprove them for that because they're not doing it the way we showed them to do it. Maybe dishes, when they're washing dishes, they don't wash them as thoroughly. But even some of us use the dishwasher a lot. So do you want them to pre-wash before they put them in? Or do you want them to run it right away while the food's still, you know, kind of moist so it won't be caked on and it does come off better? But you rebuke them if they don't do it right. But you do it gently. And you correct them. That's the third stage in this passage. Teaching, rebuking, and correcting. Redirect them. Show them the right way to do things. Psalms 119. I'm sorry. Psalms 1, 1 and 2 first. Blessed is the one who who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. Man, I did. I jumped ahead again. <laughs> After you do the correcting, we need to, to look at the training of everything. So it's teaching, rebuking, and correcting. Think of as you were a child or as you were raising your children with the cleaning of the dishes and whatever. We call it in, in habilitation, we call it hand over hand. If somebody can't do something, we put our hands over their hand and we help them manipulate it, show them the motion to do things, and then they do that. So you correct them. But then there's the fourth stage, and the fourth stage is training. That's the fourth lesson here. We have to train ourselves over and over and over again. Golfers know this. They have to get their swing in a groove. It doesn't matter if you're hitting a wedge or whether you're hitting your driver. You've got to have a swing in a groove. Baseball players, you've got to have that swing. It doesn't matter. You've got to have your form. You've got to have a swing that works for you. You've got to get in a groove. Runners, they have their way of positioning themselves in the runner's blocks. They have a way of their stride. Everybody who does a sport everybody who does any type of challenge. But you know what? Even in daily life, we have to have a daily routine. Because if we don't have a daily routine, we forget stuff. We don't accomplish things. We get scattered. We get confused. We get anxious. We have all sorts of problems that happen. But if we, get in, if we train ourselves, then we get in a routine. The military does this the best. Unfortunately, they do it quite brutally because they have basic training where they literally break you down from everything you used to know and think. They break you down to start you from ground zero and then they build you the way they want to build you. In a way, God wants that too because he also gives us that Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by a renewing of your mind. We have to remember these things because Scripture guides us. Remember, it's the owner's manual as well as the repair manual as well as the list of promises. Psalms 119, 1 through 4 is the passage that will be popped up now. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His statutes and seek Him with all their heart, they do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have been laid down precept that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees, says the psalmist. 
I like Micah 6, 8, because I think it says it very, very concisely. This is what the Lord requires of you, O man, to act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. There are scriptures everywhere in this book that teaches us how to do what 2 Timothy 3.16 is talking about. Because all scripture is God-breathed and is good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. And why? So that we will be equipped for what's to come. For every good work that God has for you. The word of God is so powerful that we have to use it. So that's what I love about the core 52, chapter 50 passage. Because he talks about, okay, now that we've told you what the passage is, now that we've told you the stages of learning in this, this is how you do that. So please find a Bible that works for you. You know, everybody, I think, should have a study Bible because those study Bibles have like maps and timelines. And if you want to research stuff, you can look and say, oh, man, where is Jerusalem? And you get to see it on the map. They, they have, oh, they're talking about denarii and they're talking about talents and they're talking about all these things. What is that measure? And then they tell you what that is. And it's like, whoa, that's a lot of money. And then you get to, you get to put it in real today thoughts because you want to understand the words you're reading so find a one that you like now i just had to go to this new one because um it is large print so be ready for that too so i have my study bible at home that i either have to wear readers or i have to use a magnifying glass because the print's really little I also have one of those massive things called a strong concordance that literally cross-references every passage with every other passage uh, based on every other, you know, message in it. And that one's got tiny print that I can't even read without a microscope. I mean, it's at that level, I feel. Um, But you, there's things out there. The version is, is a free app on your phone. That's a free Bible app. Multiple, multiple versions of the Bible. You get to push a button and it just changes right away. So it's great. There's also this call, thing called the Blue Letter Bible that you can get on that's a study help. Again, free. You just load the app and you can get in there. And it gives you all sorts of these guides that I just talked about. Maps and cross-references and, and subjects and studies. So I encourage you, find a Bible that works for you. I'm still, well, obviously I'm old, so I'm still old school. I like paper Bibles. And also, if I read my version Bible too much, my eyes just go fuzzy and I can't even see anything. So I, I, need to, I stay away from screens as much as I can. But we need to get into the Word. So when you get into it, when you find that Bible you like, use it. Because John 1, 1 through 5, tells us how important the Word of God is. 1 through 5 says... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Starting in Genesis chapter 1, God speaks words and everything is created from light to land to heaven to to every animal to every foliage and to man and woman everything was put in place by him speaking it that's how important god's word is and the bible doesn't just tell us how to live under god's authority Because like I said, this is the owner's manual. It tells us how to live under everybody's authority. Because, you know, there's going to be time when our politician doesn't win and we have a president or a senator or a representative or, or a school teacher that we don't really like. But you know what? He tells us that there is, in Romans 13, 1 through 7, there's no authority on heaven and earth that God has not ordained to be there. He's allowed him to be there. We don't know why. Maybe you just speed up his second coming. We don't know. But either way, there's a plan. God's got the plan. He tells us in the Bible how to live under the authority of the church in Hebrews 13, verse 7. 
And again, these are going to come up on a big slide. The structure of authority and responsibility of family for husbands, wives, parents, and children. And of course, I already gave you some of those in Ephesians 5, but Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2. Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. Ephesians 6, 4. And Ephesians 5, 21 to 33. If anything to do with anybody in a family is listed in those passages. How to get along with bosses and how bosses are supposed to treat their, either their slaves or servants or employees, however you want to word it, is in Ephesians 6, 5 to 9. The Bible's got the, the instructions. We just have to listen to them and follow them. And there's another reason that we get to love Scripture. We get to love Scripture because it is a list of promises to His people to all those he loves. And he loves us all. He loves everybody. He loves the world so much that he gave his only son to die on the cross for us. Verses like Joshua 1.7 that tells Joshua, as well as all of us, that as you obey God's commandments, we will be successful and prosperous. He says the same thing in Jeremiah 29.11. Now this does not mean that we are going to necessarily be financially prosperous. There's a lot of people out there that speak the prosperity gospel. And I know a lot of people who follow that and, and do that. I struggle with that because I think if you're, if you're doing it for the dollar, then you're serving the wrong master. Do what God wants you to do and let's just watch what comes to you. Don't focus on prosperity financially. Prosper means your families. Prosper means ways that you are a better person and you, you get along with more people, not because you're pleasing them, but because you're leading them. You're guiding them to a higher level of, of understanding. Matthew 6, says, you just seek the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Ephesians three twenty and 21, I have it on my Jeep in the back, uh, spare tire cover. I love that passage because I, have, I had talked to a lot of people and I had a friend who really struggled because she had some tough things going on in her life. And, and she just was waiting, waiting, waiting. And I said, just, yes, continue to wait. Be patient because you know a God that wants to give you immeasurably more than you could ever ask or imagine. He gives us promises that we get to grab onto and hold on to and wait for. In chapter 50, in Core 52, it explained about finding a Bible that works for you. It also talks about finding a quiet place at your home to do your time. So that means if you've got little kids, you either have to do it before they wake up or you got to do it after they go to bed. If you've got teenagers, then you need to do it before they wake up because they always just don't wake up early. And so just do it in the morning because you never know when they're coming home and you're going to be anxious ridden while you're waiting for them to come home. If any of you have had a teenager, that's what they do to you because, ah, oh, mom, I'll be home by 10. 1130 rolls around and you haven't heard from them and you're wanting to track them on where's my iPhone and life 360 and it's like, man, they're still over at that house. We got to get in back. And so don't be anxious, but just pray. We have a promise that as we follow these precepts of God, that we get to accept, actually before we follow the precepts, if we just accept the love of Jesus Christ, into our heart, the sacrifice of Christ as the final sacrifice, then we get to have eternal life. And I want to close with this final verse in Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, the things present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor any else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have one thing to remember in this entire book. And that is, Jesus died for you and he rose again. And because of that, we don't have anything to worry about. Don't forget what this book says.
don't forget to use what this book says. And please, use what you've learned. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that we cannot do anything to earn your love. You just gave it to us. And not just your love, but your forgiveness. And not just your forgiveness, but your restoration back into your family. Because you, Father, sacrificed your one and only Son. And you gave us the Holy Spirit to live the rest of life through that. We ask you to just bless every person here. There's a lot of hurts. There's a lot of fears. There's a lot of uncertainties. But this is what we know. God's got it. In Jesus' name, amen.